Good evening. I'm Pastor Robert Meisel, it's serving at St. Paul in Round Lake Park. This will be a new experience for me, uh, doing the Taze uh, evening prayer service. Uh, you should have a copy, but it's all going to be on the, the screens as well. Our theme for these services is ironies of the passion. You're going to hear a whole bunch of ironies this, this evening uh, in connection with tonight's theme. We begin. Now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. Turn us again, O God of our salvation. And the light of your face may shine on us. May your justice shine like the sun. And may the Lord be lifted up. Let's give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who led your people Israel by a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. Enlighten our darkness by the light of your Christ. May his word be a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. For you are merciful and you love your whole creation, and we, your creatures, glorify you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Psalm for this evening is Psalm 115. Those congregation, the choir and congregation will sing the refrain. Oh 
Lord is my praise, God the wellspring of life. Not to us, Lord, not to us, but to your name be the glory, because of your love and faithfulness. Why do the nations say, where is their God? Our God is in heaven. He does whatever pleases him. us and will bless us. He will bless his people Israel. He will bless the house of Aaron. He will bless those who fear the Lord, small and great alike. you to flourish both you and your children may you be blessed by the Lord the maker of heaven and earth Lord of heaven and earth, to worship you. We cling to your promise to remember us and bless us as your people. Therefore, we fear you as God. Fill our hearts that we may sing your praises and declare your glory to the ends of your earth. For Jesus' sake. Amen. This evening's Passion History from the uh, Video Bible uh, is uh, Matthew 26, verses 36 to 56, uh, Gethsemane, and Jesus is arrested. Thank you. 
Gethsemane. And he said to them, Sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Thank you. 
bishops, sent from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had arranged a signal with him. The one I kiss is the man. Many and various ways God spoke to his people of old by the prophets. The Lenten hymn is sung two times.
God's grace, mercy, and peace be yours now and always through Jesus, our crucified Savior. Amen. Our text for our meditation this evening is recorded in St. Luke's Gospel, chapter 23, beginning with verse 39. Um, I'm going to read from the NIV 1984 version. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence. We were punished justly, for we were getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, I tell you the truth. Today, you'll be with me in paradise. So far, this portion, the word of our God. In the name of our dear Savior, dear Christian friends. Do you recognize the names Chester A. Arthur and Julia Sands? Well, I think the first you probably recognize, uh, the second one probably not. Chester A. Arthur was the 21st President of the United States, took over when President James Garfield was assassinated in 1881. Now his career took a very ironic twist when he inherited the presidency. You see, n no one had expected him to be president. He was put on the ticket to heal a rift in the Republican Party. And even though Arthur had been a Republican for many years, the previous president, also a Republican, had actually fired him from his job as a collector of customs in New York City. Now that was the richest government job in America at that particular time. It was considered to be a fountain of corruption. Now, Arthur evidently didn't do anything technically wrong, but he made a lot of money there. And he hired a lot of Republican cronies to unnecessary high-paying jobs. And so when the brand new president died, many people thought that the best thing that Arthur could do was to resign. However, a young woman named Julia Sands wrote a series of letters to him calling on him to defy many people's expectations and become a good president. Arthur took her letters to heart, persuaded Congress to pass reform legislation that also included his old job. And then he vigorously enforced that legislation. He shocked friend and foe alike by permanently changing the way the American government ran. Well, this evening we have before us the words of another man who would have shocked anyone who knew him. Those words formed tonight's irony of the passion. Don't you fear God? Now, unlike the story of President Arthur, the count of the criminal, whose words we're considering this evening is very well known, even though we, we don't know his name. But don't let familiarity blind you to the irony in these words. Don't you fear God? A dying criminal came to faith on a cross. Now, since this is actually sermon number six in the Synod series, by the time that I get to preach it in my congregation in Round Lake, members there will have heard a whole bunch of ironies. I myself like ironies when they happen. I actually like to use the word quite often, ironic. But what's kind of ironic about that is that I'm not always sure that I use that word correctly. Uh, Purists writing on, on blogs uh, complain that it's often misused to remark a, a coincidence, to make a remark concerning coincidence or to describe something that's out of the ordinary. 
Singer Alanis Morissette was severely taken to task uh, back in 1995 for her hit, ironic, because they said that uh, many of the things technically were not ironic. And so, what does the word really mean? Well, the dictionary's first definition is meaning the opposite of what is expressed. For example, if we're, we're trying to be ironic uh, during stormy weather, we might say, oh, what gorgeous weather. Or if you're suffering from a bad cold, you might say, I feel like a million bucks. Now, these are examples of verbal irony, the most common occurrence of that figure of speech. Now, is there an example of that irony in tonight's text? Well, maybe a little bit with the insults that the impenitent criminal hurled at Jesus. Aren't you the Christ? Save yourself and us. Did he really believe that Jesus was the Messiah? That he could save himself and them? Mimicking the unbelieving shouts of the Jewish leaders down below, I, I would say not. But there are some commentators who maintain that that's really what he wanted uh, uh, of Jesus, that he would be a mighty Messiah so that he could escape the cross and death, go on living a wicked life uh, to cheat justice. I don't doubt that that's what he wanted, but uh, by taunting Jesus the way that, that he did, it seems apparent that he didn't feel that Jesus was the Christ, that he could therefore not save anybody, as the religious leaders were implying. Now, a second type of irony, I think it's the way I usually use it, is what's called situational irony, which is an outcome that turns out to be different from what was expected. Many examples on the internet are quite humorous. Some, some of them are a little obtuse, hard to understand. But, but here's, here's one. It'd be ironic if two marriage counselors got a divorce from one another. In my own life, I, I found it very ironic that uh, though I took the minimum amount of German at, in the, at Northwestern Prep and Northwestern College, that I was assigned to be a vicar student pastor in a congregation that had German. And then I actually stayed there a second year in emergency capacity. And then after saying, I'm never going to preach German again, well, then I actually took a call to another congregation that had German and preaching that language for nine more years. The year before my first vicar year, I thought it rather ironic when my father, who had uh, been a highly respected public high school teacher in my hometown, he died very suddenly, and the substitute pastor filling in for our vacation pastor actually preached on this text. I was a little bit surprised, I think maybe even a little bit offended by that. But now this has actually become one of my favorite texts because of the great comfort that is there for us criminals when it comes to God's law. Now, we really don't have to work too hard at finding a number of ironies uh, in this evening's text. Because Roman crucifixions required serious logistical uh, support with all the items that were needed, the uh, poles, the cross beams, uh, the nails, uh, the rope, and so forth. And then the soldiers that were needed to guard those prisoners and that control the, the crowd that came out there to, to gawk at those spectacles. Well, ordinarily there would have been uh, a, a time between when the, the sentence was passed and then when the sentence was finally carried out. But the impatient Jewish leaders wanted Jesus crucified that day. Well, it just happened to be part of the 14th day of Nisan when the Passover lamb was to be slain. And so God's own timetable was followed. And, and the two criminals who were th there in prison awaiting their execution, they were included in this whole crucifixion spectacle just to keep things efficient. 
And so this whole wonderful conversation, this amazing exchange between that penitent criminal and Jesus would not have taken place without this. Now, as you know well, as soon as Jesus was nailed across, his enemies began, began to mock him. If you're the Christ, save yourself. And both of those criminals joined in, as Matthew and Mark clearly tell us. And they echoed the words of the Jewish leaders. Aren't you the Christ? Save yourself and us. And that's so typical of mockers, isn't it? To throw a person's own words back into his face. Well, the irony here is that Jesus was staying up in, on that cross to really do what they were asking of him. Now, of course, those two men were hoping that Jesus would somehow get them down from the cross, use his almighty power that way. But by not using his power in that way was a way that Jesus could actually save. Now, we know that Jesus remained silent in the midst of all of the mockery and scorn, just as Isaiah had prophesied. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before his shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. How ironic that the good shepherd took on the role of the sheep lamb. Now, is that what finally connected all of the dots for that penitent thief? We really know so little about that man. Though the Bible doesn't spell out the crimes of, of the two, the Greek words that are, are, are used here uh, do imply that there was stealing and that there was violence and there could have been murder too. These men were habitual offenders. They deserved the death penalty. But without warning, seemingly out of the blue, the one asks the other, don't you fear God? Since you are under the same sentence, we are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Boy, where did that come from, especially tonight's theme question? Don't you fear God? You know, if either of these men had feared God, they wouldn't have been on death row, about to die most painful death. Now, since God has written to the heart of every individual being a, a knowledge uh, uh, that God is going to judge us when we die, well, maybe we shouldn't be surprised that even in a hardened criminal, the fear of facing holy God finally comes out. But what's really so surprising is that this criminal so quickly turned from mockery and unbelief to faith. His confession is amazing. His prayer to Jesus even more so. What lifelong believer would have been so bold as to make such a confession, which included a rejection of a popular side, taking a lonely position, when all the numbers are stacked against him, when the leaders below had all the appearance of right and the weight of authority, when even Jesus' own disciples had abandoned him, except for John. How did this man, who now acknowledged the justice of his own execution, come to the conclusion that he did here at this late moment of his life? Scholars have long debated this question. There is kind of a common assumption that oh, he must have been a Jew who now just remembered his childhood catechism lessons. I suppose that's possible. But there was certainly plenty here in his brief contact with Jesus. This man, who certainly had seen plenty of the sins of the righteous and the religious, had justified the utter cynicism as a hardened criminal like himself. He knew from his own excruciating agony what was inclined to spill forth from a man who was hanging uh, from a cross. And down below, he saw a lot of human nature taking place there, and the soldiers, the crowd, and the religious leaders. 
But you know, none of that human nature was evident in that man who hung there in the middle. Indeed, after seeing Jesus for what, only an hour or two, especially after all that brutal mockery, it became obvious to him that that man was different. And if it, you know, it certainly was true that no man ever spoke as that one did, as the Sanhedrin's own police force once acknowledged. Well, it was also true that no man ever suffered as that man did. And this is what the criminal confessed. It was his very first confession of faith. And what a confession it was. Famous Lutheran commentator says, don't ask to know all that transpired in his heart. Do not dissect it. The Holy Spirit obviously was working mightily. And ironically, there was so much that was said in the mockery there below the cross that this man came to realize was absolutely true. Ponder the miracle here, what we could call the last and the first. This man became the last person to testify in favor of Jesus before his death. The first person who turned to Christ crucified and believe in him as Lord and Savior. He asked for no sign or proof of Jesus' sovereignty. His heart needed none. And with the simplicity of great faith, he prays, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He did not ask Jesus to help him down from the cross or somehow alleviate his suffering. Only to be remembered was his humble request. You know, in our prayers, you and I so often specifically tell the Lord what we want done for ourselves and for our loved ones. Could we ever be so content to leave everything up to the Lord, satisfied with standing room only in heaven if that was the Lord's will? See, so many ironies in these words. Yeah, even, even this tiny little one, that a liturgical number with these words in, no, not the beautiful one that was sung before, uh, but uh, a, a different one that I have never used in my congregation, now has become kind of a favorite for me. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Oh yes, there's so many ironies to be found in these words, and maybe especially with how we actually view people who have been rescued out of some god-awful lies in the nick of time. I've seen some Christians who have resented greatly funeral services conducted for people who made a deathbed confession. But God's grace isn't really going to mean anything until we see ourselves as that malefactor did with many sins that make us deserving of an awful death. And I would hope that one of the ironies is not this, that uh, so many Christians who love the hymn Amazing Grace don't really believe that when they're singing that line, who saved a wretch like me. God has been just as generous to us as he was to that criminal. You know, since hatred is murder and, and greed is robbery in God's eyes, our sins really are very similar. But Jesus has paid for them all. And so what Jesus promised that criminal, paradise with him, he has also promised to us. As remarkable as that man's prayer was, recognizing that Jesus would come into his kingdom, some think maybe uh, at the final consummation of all things, Jesus' answer to his prayer far exceeds it. Begins with a seal of truthfulness, amen. Coupled with words of authority, I say to do, today you will be with me in paradise. You know, if no one had 
could have ever expected that this man would witness to Christ? Who would have expected that Christ would have witnessed what he did to him? In the face of all the taunts and the mockery, Jesus had remained absolutely silent. But to this plea from this contrite criminal, he answers without delay. He essentially was declaring this with a divine oath, an oath to such a man as this. And here also was a prophecy, but one that was going to be fulfilled that very same day. You know, normally it would take a crucified individual three to four days to die. That was kind of the insane genius of that mode of execution. But not only was this man suffering going to end within a matter of hours, his soul was going to be in paradise. No, well, not purgatory, but God's home, the abode of the angels the dwelling place of all the blessed. In the story of uh, the rich man and poor Lazarus, Lazarus' picture is being in Abraham's bosom or at Abraham's side. Here, the promise is paradise, an ancient Persian word that uh, means a pleasant garden or park. Garden of Eden was such a paradise. Having been to so many beautiful national and state parks, this has always been a very exquisite word for me. But two further words are far better. With me. Heaven's choicest blessing is the fellowship and the companionship of Jesus, the beloved Savior. The promise is completely unrestricted, not conditioned upon any merit, performance, or service just the result of God's mercy and grace in connection with Jesus' work on Calvary's cross. And here, here is another irony that heaven's doors were unlocked for this prisoner while he was hanging from a cross. Now let me ask you, when has this scene been most vivid for you? You know, there is so much pain in this life. Many diseases like cancer can have some great pain. Maybe pain that approaches that of a crucified individual. Maybe pain that actually lasts a whole lot longer. Many have experienced an emotional pain that they feel can be so terrible, such as an unfaithful spouse or children that abandon their, their parents. Parents who abuse their children. An addiction that just won't let go. But here's another great irony. And many of God's hurting people have very freely acknowledged that in the midst of some great suffering, anguish, distress, that the work of Christ on the cross shines forth most radiantly. It certainly did for that penitent thief. And who would have thunk it? <laughs> no one who followed Jesus out to Calvary that day could have expected to hear that confession that that criminal gave. But those are some of the great miracles that our God loves to perform. And the faith that the Holy Spirit has worked in our hearts is really a very similar miracle. Now, whether we would call that ironic isn't really the point. But when the Savior finally says to each one of us, today, you will be with me in paradise, that will certainly be something. Amen. Now the peace of God that surpasses all human understanding, guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus, our blessed Savior. Amen.
present, O oh merciful God, and protect us through the silent hours of this night, so that we who are wearied by the changes and chances of this fleeting world may rest in your eternal changelessness through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. O oh Lord, support us all day long till the shadows lengthen and the evening comes, and the busy world is hushed and the fever of life is over, and our work is done. Then, in your mercy, grant us a safe lodging and a holy rest and peace at last. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. O oh God, our Father, by your mercy and might, the world turns safely into darkness and returns again to light. We place into your hands our unfinished task, our unsolved problems, and our unfulfilled hopes, knowing that only what you bless will prosper. To your great love and protection, we commit each other and all those we love, knowing that you alone are our sure defender through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Keep watch, dear Lord, with those who watch or work or weep this night, and give your angels charge over those who sleep. Tend the sick, give rest to the weary, pity the afflicted, soothe the suffering, bless the dying, and all for your love's sake, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Look down, O Lord, from your heavenly throne and illuminate this light with your celestial brightness that by night as by day your people may glorify your holy name through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread Forgive our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The congregation will be seated to sing the Lenten hymn two times. you have called your servants the ventures of which we cannot see the ending by paths as yet untrodden through perils unknown. Give us faith to go out with good courage, not knowing where we go, but only that your hand is leading us, your love supporting us, and with the knowledge that you will always remember us through Jesus Christ our Lord. The Almighty and merciful Lord, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, bless and preserve us. Amen. We sing the closing hymn 587.
land, field and meadow, the world in slumber lies, but you, my heart, awaken with prayer and song be taken to praise to your Creator. shall shine in heaven where crowns of gold are given to all who faithful prove and true Lord Jesus since you love me oh spread your wings above me and shield me from alarm though Satan would assail me your mercy will not fail me I rest in your protecting arm my loved ones rest securely for God this night will surely from peril guard our heads sweet slumbers may he send you and through the night watch o'er your path. Once again, good evening to uh, everyone here. It uh, certainly was a privilege uh, for me to be part of your uh, service uh, this evening. I thought it was uh, beautiful. We aren't blessed with the uh, great musicians that, that you have here, uh, so I, I enjoyed that uh, uh, greatly. Uh, I think in recent years I haven't been here that much. It's the way we often have had seven pastors, so it means we have to miss one. I'm the scheduler and uh, we like to help out our long distance people. It seemed like I was a number of times missing your congregation. It is good uh, to be back here this year. Uh, safe travels for everybody. I think, uh, I think we're fine with the, the snow. Thankful that it uh, missed us. Have a good rest of the, the Lenten season. Actually, uh, we're halfway through the midweek services. Hard to believe.